Does God change in any way? Does God in any way experience emotion? Does God uh, <clears throat> does God experience a passage of time in any sense of that phraseology? And why does God permit the existence of evil if he's the thrice holy God of the Bible um, who abhors sin and promises not to tolerate it forever? These are the kinds of questions that we'll discuss uh, when, we when we discuss the divine attributes, the attributes of God, in today's episode of The Apologetics. Hi, this is Chris Date, and welcome to The Apologetics where every other week I discuss a wide variety of theological issues and show how a properly biblical worldview can help defend the historic Christian faith from its critics. Join me as we think through what we believe and why we believe it, and not something else. Hello, I'm Chris Date, and welcome to another episode of The Apologetics. Um, just as a reminder, please do, when the video's over, if you enjoyed what you watched, I'd appreciate it if you would click that like button and then subscribe to the channel and click the notifications bell to receive notifications. All that stuff, as you've probably heard a bajillion times by now, um, helps, um, helps the YouTube algorithms to give my show better exposure across YouTube. So I'd appreciate your support in those ways. Also, I mentioned two weeks ago in the last episode of the show that my wife and I are celebrating our 21st anniversary. Um, indeed, that's coming up in just two, uh, well, in just under two weeks. And I mentioned in the last episode of the show that I received a donation from one of you listeners. Uh, well, actually, a couple, uh, a couple who listens to my show. Um, and, uh, and and I said that I would put that I'm going to put that toward our anniversary celebration. We're actually going to go to the, I think they're called the San Juan Islands, uh, a couple hours north of us, north of Seattle. Um, we're going to go do some whale watching and stuff like that. And uh, if for whatever reason, and if not, this is totally okay, I'm not going to pressure you about it, but if you want to support um, my ministry by helping me to make my anniversary special for my wife, uh, then you can use PayPal and the email address on your screen right now, theapologetics.hotmail.com. If you'd like to make a donation of any amount uh and i will put it toward um our anniversary at least any at least any um donations that i received before <laughs> our anniversary if you're watching this and it's not live and you're watching this more than two weeks after it's aired uh then obviously your donations won't go toward our anniversary celebration because we'll have already celebrated it um, but I will still welcome your donations after that. Um, really quick, a couple of things I want to say before I uh, jump into today's interview. And I am going to be interviewing a guest, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment before I transition into that interview. Firstly, um, I want to remind you, as I think I mentioned uh, in the last episode of The Apologetics, that... The next episode of the show, two weeks from today, is tentatively going to be an interview with Dr. Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute. Um, he's really notable for his work in the field of intelligent design, and he recently published a book called The Return of the God Hypothesis, which is absolutely fantastic. And somehow, by God's grace, I managed to get my show um, penciled in on his calendar for two weeks from today, and that will be a live interview. So the two weeks from today is Monday, May 31st. And as per usual, the show will air at 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so if you want to hear about uh, Dr. Meyer's book, the, the Return of the God Hypothesis, um, tune into that show. I think it'll be really fantastic. Now, here's the thing. I did use the phrase pencil in. Um, and by the way, hi, Jonathan. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Um, I did say pencil in. Uh, Steve, the, Stephen Meyer's assistant confirmed for me that Dr. Meyer says um, his calendar is free on that day and time, and he's penciled me in. But he did say there's a possibility that something pressing might come uh, come up between now and then, in which case um, we would have to reschedule. In the event that that happens, and I'm praying and hoping that it does not, but if it does, I think what I'll do as a plan B is talk about two texts, I think it is, in the New Testament that are often thought to 
to indicate that Jesus' disciples believed in ghosts and thought at times they were seeing ghosts. I'm, I'm thinking in particular of when Jesus invites his disciples to touch his wounds post-resurrection, and he says, uh, spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And then I think that when he's calming the sea or he's on the, he's, he's walking on the water, um, the text says that the disciples thought they were seeing a phantasm. And again, a lot of uh, interpreters understand this to be a belief, uh, uh, evidence that the disciples believed in ghosts and thought they were seeing a ghost in the sense of a disembo uh, disembodied human soul or spirit. Well, I don't think those texts, I don't think that's what those texts are saying. And I've been kind of toying around with talking about why. So if the Dr. Meyer interview falls through and it has to be rescheduled, then I'll probably talk about those passages. Um, otherwise, tune in for uh, the interview and I think we're going to have a really good time. Um, the second thing I want to remind you of is that uh, not last episode of the show, but I think the one before that, I mentioned, I, I think I went through um, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, and how that seems to challenge uh, premillennialism and favor amillennialism, uh, the view that I hold of the thousand years in Revelation chapter 20. And I mentioned that one of the reasons I was publishing that episode was because I was in the very near future going to be recording an episode of Justin Brierley's Unbelievable, um, debating a dispensational premillennialist friend of mine on premillennialism versus amillennialism. Well, we're going to be recording that discussion tomorrow, um, Tuesday, May 18th. Uh, so I would be very much grateful for your prayers, not that amillennialism would come out on top or anything, but that the truth would be revealed and that um, my opponents and my friendship with one another and, and our admiration and respect for one another would make for a cordial, respectful, and friendly conversation, but one in which we nevertheless hold each other's feet to the proverbial fire. Um, I think that uh, I think that the arguments I will be offering for amillennialism are very strong and, and really make uh, premillennialism untenable as a reading of Revelation chapter 20 and of 1 Corinthians 15. So I'm looking forward to having that discussion, but at the same time, as I said, I have the utmost of admiration and respect for uh, my opponent, and so um, and, and I consider him a friend. So I think that we're going to have a really good conversation. I don't know when it will air. My guess is that it will be either this coming Friday or the Friday after that, or Friday slash Saturday. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not sure, and I will post on Facebook and maybe on Twitter uh, as soon as I know when it will air. But I would appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, and one thing I um, am really looking forward to um, to highlighting in our conversation that we record tomorrow is that as an amillennialist, I actually agree with my dispensational premillennial, premillennialist opponent when it comes to the identity of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the church, and when it comes to our love for the Jewish people, um, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, uh, and what's more, I maintain belief that um, God's promises to those people in the Old Testament remain in effect and um, uh, and have not been are not strictly uh, prophecies that find their fulfillment in the, in the church or even in Jesus himself. So um, so that's going to be really interesting, I think, because most amillennialists part ways with me on Israel. Um, and uh, I'd like to show that the identity of Israel and whether or not the promises to her were actually promises to the church, those are not, I repeat, those are not defining features of any millennial view. Very often, you will read that in the literature. You will read that that's a distinctive of amillennialism and postmillennialism, you know, that Israel is the church and that the promises to Israel in the Old Testament were actually promises to the church, whereas premillennialists, especially dispensationalists, would say contrary. Um, but I'm going to be making the case that that is actually not uh, a dividing line between premill and on the one hand and amill or postmill on the other. So um, I'm hoping to challenge some of the sort of prevailing um, taxonomy. Um, and I'll be arguing that the only uh, distinctive defining feature of amillennialism uh, as opposed to premillennialism is the nature and timing of that thousand years. Hey, Phil Fox, good to have you in the good to have you watching. I appreciate it. Um, uh, 
So yeah, I'll be making the argument, or, or even if only implicitly, that the only defining feature of amillennialism as contrast to premillennialism is the timing and nature of the thousand years of Revelation 20. Uh, Israel, um, the church, the promises to Israel, all those things are not in fact defining features, not distinguishing factors in this debate, and I look forward to making my case for that um, when we record that episode of Unbelievable tomorrow. So again, just please do uh, keep us in your prayers and be on the lookout for that episode of unbelievable, which, uh, as I said, I suspect will come out in the near future, but I don't know precisely when. Now, having mentioned Israel, I do want to say one last thing before I transition into what we're going to be doing today. Um, I am not at all in this episode um, asking any of you viewers to agree with me on either uh, the identity of Israel, biblically speaking, or whether or not the nation state of Israel today is a fulfillment of prophecy or whether they deserve our unmitigated, un, unremitting support or anything like that. I'm not asking for you to agree with me in siding with the people of Israel um, over against its uh, the, the, the people that are trying to terrorize Israel. Um, nothing like that. However, as many of you viewers will know, the there is an extremely active and intensifying conflict in the Middle East right now between Israel and Hamas um, and ostensibly or at least the pretense of that conflict at least on Hamas's side is uh, the alleged injustices um, on the part of Israel toward the Palestinian people in so-called occupied land um, and what I am asking you, my viewers, to do with me uh, is pray. I'd like to think that you could agree with me, regardless of what you think about Israel, regardless of what you think about whether you know they are the they remain uh, God's chosen people or anything like that. Regardless of those things, I think you could agree with me that both sides of the conflict um, we need them to come to some sort of a peace arrangement, and um, I don't know what that looks like. Um, I know what I would prefer. I know what lots of people would prefer. But regardless of uh, those preferences, I think you could agree with me that we want to see peace um, in that conflict, uh, peace from that conflict. And so if you would please do me a favor and consider praying that God would work supernaturally and miraculously in that land and bring the current conflict to a, uh, a point of peace, um, I would be grateful for that. Even if you think I'm out to lunch on Israel and my support for the current nation state of Israel. Um, so please be praying about that. I'd love to see tensions be relieved and 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 then reach a, a point of peace while the various nations involved including israel and including the people of palestine uh, the palestinian people discuss what the future may look like in terms of um which you know two state solutions and all that kind of stuff it's a very complicated issue um, and I'm not asking for your whole agreement on all those things. I'm just asking for you to pray with me for peace between Israel and the Palestinian people. Okay. With all that having said, having been said, let me tell you what's going to happen today. First of all, you are right now, if you're watching live, um, watching me live. I'm, I am here, and that's why I said hello to Jonathan Green and hello to Phil Fox, who are both in the chat. However, the interview that you're about to watch has been pre-recorded, and that's just because Dr. Peckham's and my schedule just didn't work out such that he could be here live. Um, so what I'm going to do here in a moment is transition into the interview. That will be pre-recorded. For parts of that, I may be around and available in the live chat to, to discuss with you. Um, but I actually need to go finish a movie that I started with my kids before I do that. So as soon as I transition in the interview, I'm going to go do what I should do as a father and finish out that movie with my boys. Um, and then I'll come back uh, when we're done with that. Um, and do the outro and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so you are watching me live, but what you will be seeing in a moment is an interview that has been pre-recorded. Now, that interview was with my friend, Dr. John Peckham. John Peckham is a professor of systematic theology and philosophy, I believe, at Andrews University. I think he and I first came to know each other uh, uh, because of my work with the ministry Rethinking Hell, um, and that will come up ex ever so briefly in the conversation you're going to be listening to. But I have been an admirer of Dr. Peckham's 
for several years now, and I've been a fan of some of the work that I've read from him. I enjoyed his book, Canonical Theology. I think that I read part of his Theodicy of Love. Um, I think uh, I think I've I think there may be even a show uh, a, a a book that he wrote that I interviewed him about on the Theopologetics podcast years ago before it became this YouTube show. Um, so I've been a fan of his work for some time, um, and and he's the only person I have ever interacted with who speaks and thinks faster than I do, which uh, which scares me a little bit. <laughs> um, but it was but anyway, he recently published a book that you'll be hearing us talk about called uh, Divine Attributes: Knowing the Covenantal God of Scripture. And it's all about what systematic theologians refer to as the attributes of God or the divine attributes or the divine perfections, things like immutability and omniscience and omnipresence and all those different kinds of things. Well, um, I received in the mail uh, unsolicited a copy of Dr. Peckham's book direct from the publisher, Baker Academic. Um, and I was surprised. I had no idea that, that I was going to be sent that. But evidently, Dr. Peckham had asked his publisher to... Uh, when the publisher asked Dr. Peckham for some people to send review copies of the book to in order to help them promote the book and stuff like that... Um, Evidently, Dr. Peckham gave them my name, and I was extremely honored and touched that he would think about me in that way. And so the very first thing I did as soon as I saw that he'd sent me that book is I reached out to him and asked if he'd like to be interviewed on my show about it. And he graciously and enthusiastically said he uh, he would love to. So what you're about to watch is an interview. It's about an hour and a half long, maybe slightly less than that, an hour and 20 minutes, that I recorded recently with Dr. Peckham on his book, The Divine Attributes. And what you're going to hear for a bulk of the bulk of that conversation is um, is a discussion. Our discussions around immutability, impassibility, um, eternality or timelessness, and theodicy, with some other things sprinkled in along the way. So I think it's gonna. I think you're gonna enjoy it. It was a fascinating discussion. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I think that you will too. So I'll go ahead and transition into that interview and come back uh, at some point before the outro to engage in the chat and uh, do the outro. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> to be able to call you a, a friend. Dr. Peckham, John, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to have you on and an honor to be able to call you a, a friend. Uh, and, and again, just thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So one of the things I enjoy doing with many of my interview guests before getting started is giving them an opportunity to share their faith background, their testimony, even if they have one. Um, you know, viewers will know that I came to faith relatively late in life, having not been raised in any sort of outwardly Christian home, um, uh, whereas lots of other people uh, embrace faith very early on in their lives. So what about you? Or did you count yourself a Christian from an early age, or is it something that you came to later in life? T tell us about that. Yeah, I was a pastor's kid, so I grew up as a PK, and I really had a great experience. My father was a youth pastor, uh, both of my parents very strong in their faith, and uh, my father had uh, a significant library, so I also grew up uh, with being encouraged to read, read Christian books, and uh, l learned a lot, uh, formed by writers like C.S. Lewis and others, uh, and really, really uh, loved God for as long as I can remember. Of course, I went through my own years where uh, I, I was doing my own thing. I, I was never really rebellious in, in, any, in any real sense, uh, but I just kind of drifted and was going to go my own way. And then I, I really felt a strong call towards ministry. I was on a track to go into business. Nothing wrong with that at all, uh, but I felt very strongly convicted that God wanted me to use uh, whatever gifts I had been given uh, for to serve him in a ministry capacity, and then they end up ended up taking an ac academic route, and and here I am. Well, that's exactly the next thing I wanted to ask you about because a lot of Christians, when they feel a calling to the ministry, are going to typically think something like pastoral ministry, um, you know, or or some other similar type role. Whereas it's a a different kind of calling to go into academic ministry, and in you you in particular, um, if if you'll. Forgive the, the 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 bragging about you a little bit. I mean, you're 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 a seemingly real rising star. You're publishing with big publishers, and and it's uh, you know you've got some really great work that I find incredibly impressive and compelling on uh, specifically systematic theology type issues uh, like the ones we're going to be talking about today. So my question for you is, um, as you started to sense God's call into the ministry and stuff like that, when like what what made you realize or what drew you to uh, to systematic theology and philosophy and 
particular? What, where did you come to realize that that was where you were particularly called to? Yeah, I remember uh, being in seminary, doing the, the Master of Divinity, and just by taking different classes, I think uh, originally when I felt called towards an academic route, I thought I might do a PhD in New Testament, always love biblical studies, still do love exegesis. Uh, but I remember taking some classes that were dealing with the big picture issues. And still from a very biblical uh, perspective, uh, but just seeing the way the pieces fit together and the broad picture and drawing from Old and New Testament together, I, that I just I just felt called that this is already the way my mind works. Uh, some of the kinds of questions that were being asked were the questions that I was most interested in uh, looking into. So I ended up doing my PhD uh, with the, the major area being systematic theology, and I did my cognate, which is like a minor in Old Testament study. So I have some of the exegetical background as well, uh, which to me is, is frankly essential to doing systematic theology. Work. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I, I am a big fan of systematic theology, but I am sympathetic to the critics of some who see a lot of systematic theologians sort of forcing their systematic onto the pages of scripture where I've always seen the relationship as meant to be the other way around. Yes, systematics can help us properly interpret parts of scripture that are less clear because we have clearer texts elsewhere, but but it really seems to me that 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 the system has got to be built upon the foundation of the text and and that's what I really appreciate about what you just said there. Um some of our viewers, though, and, and here's here's where I, I'm going to ask you what may be a little bit of a tough question. Um, there are some of my viewers who are going to have a very negative opinion about the Seventh-day Adventist um, denomination, probably in part or in large part even because of misconceptions about Adventism. And you, you know, you teach at Andrews University, which I'm going to ask you about in a moment, which is a Seventh-day Adventist university. I think you yourself uh, are a self or a Seventh-day Adventist. So what I was hoping you might be able to speak to a little bit is my viewers who have those kinds of concerns, you know, they they, they might have encountered Seventh-day Adventists who have a strange, even problematic view of the Trinity, or um, that they seem to think that salvation is in part by works and not just by grace through faith. Um, would you say that those kinds of concerns are entirely unfounded? Do you think maybe they're just they're misunderstanding Seventh-day Adventism? Or do you think that maybe there are sort of sub- subcultures within Adventism that might be a little bit more problematic than others? Just sort of open question. What would you have to say to those kinds of things? Yeah, so I'd say a couple things. I mean, first of all, so the official teachings of Seventh-day Adventist Adventism uh, directly affirms the Trinity and directly denies any kind of salvation by works. So salvation by faith alone, of course, a, a faith in Christ as our Savior and Lord will, will, will amount to works, right? You can't separate justification from sanctification, although they are distinct. Uh, but salvation is by faith alone through Christ alone with the fruits that will accompany that faith if we are in Christ by faith. Uh, when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, Adventists also uh, firmly believe in the Trinity. It is true that there were uh, some pioneers of the Adventist church uh, that had some mistaken understandings of the Trinity, uh, but the Adventist Church officially uh, endorses the Trinity doctrine uh, that God is one, only one God in three distinct persons. Mm, okay, good. Well, I hope that at least um, sort of opens some hearts that are watching to um, to being open to some you know what you have to say uh, and and thank you for being patient with me as I ask that question but turning now to Andrews University um, as I said Andrews University is a Seventh-day Adventist school but I'd like to think you would probably think that there's good reasons for viewers who aren't even Seventh-day Adventist but are looking for a Christian higher education to consider Andrews University so what what drew you to Andrews University to teach there and, and what do you, why might viewers that are looking for a Christian higher education want, why do you think they might want to consider Andrews University for theirs? Yeah, Andrews University is a great place to work, great place to study. Um, I did my, my own uh, graduate studies here at Andrews University, including PhD, and uh, really enjoyed the community, very collegial community, um, very strong uh, liberal arts education and background. We also have a very diverse campus, one of the most diverse uh, uh, student bodies in the United States of America. Uh, so it is uh, just a wonderful place to study, wonderful place uh, to raise a family. If somebody's here for graduate studies, uh, 
uh, and uh, really enjoy living here uh, in, in Berrien Springs. And the Andrews community has, has been a blessing to our family, both when I was a student and now as a, as a professor as well. Mm, cool. All right, well, let's start talking about the, the book that you recently published, which I'll name in a moment and we'll dive into. But I want to begin by um, talking about the divine attributes within the larger field of systematic theology. Tell us what the divine attributes are. When we talk about the attributes of God, what are we talking about? And, and why would you say that the study of those attributes um, is important enough to merit, you know, publishing a whole book on it? And, and for those of us who aren't publishing, why we, why we might want to buy a book on nothing but the divine attributes? Talk, talk about that. Yeah, so the divine attributes is another way of speaking about characteristics that God has, what some people refer to as divine perfections. And it's really trying to answer the question, what is God like? Uh, what are the characteristics that God has? And it's, of course, important to any theology and even the Christian faith more broadly, because what you believe about God is going to affect literally everything else in your theology, whether you're thinking systematically, intentionally or not, uh, all the d distinct parts of are connected and they have one another and so the way you answer certain questions about who God is and what God is like are going to affect the way you relate to God personally uh, and the way you view everything else so basic practical questions that that every question every Christian has is questions about uh, uh, who is the God that we pray to how does it even make sense to pray right uh, what kind of God does it make sense to pray to who is the God that we worship right those are basic basic questions of Christian faith and practice. And then more specific kinds of questions that have massive implications are questions like, does God change? Does God have emotions? If so, what does that mean? Uh, does God know the future? Is God entirely good? How does that relate to, to things like evil in the world? How can God be one in three, as we alluded to earlier? Uh, and, and all of these uh, and many other questions about God have massive implications. And ultimately, for me, uh, studying these questions which we should always do with humility, studying these questions, doing theology for me is just an, an act of worship, mm -hmm. where the more I come to know about God through revelation, the more I'm drawn to worship God and want to know him better, not just cognitively, but relationally. But to me, these things go together. I think uh, this the, 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 the separation of theory and practice is a false dichotomy. <laughs> yeah. I think they, they always must go together. And so my Christian faith and my Christian walk uh, is is fed by thinking about the God of the Bible, what he has revealed. And so this particular work is is in kind of a, a stream of other works that brings to fruition some of my some of my earlier work on God and tries to delve into some of these questions that that all Christians have that relate to all the other uh, topics of theology. Very good. Well, well, let's talk about that stream of work. I'm going to hold up here for the audience your your new book, Divine Attributes: Knowing the Covenantal God of Scripture. Uh, Baker Academic, I think, is the publisher this year, right? Um, so, my question for you is: first of all, what what motivated you to make this your next big writing project? Um, and number two, how was it different from your 2019 book, The Doctrine of God, which just a brief look at the table of contents looks an awful lot like this one. And I'm just wondering why, you know, why might listeners, if they had to choose between one or the other, why might they want to choose this one rather than the other? Yeah, good. Yeah. So, so the doctrine of God is my, my main area of expertise. I wrote my dissertation on divine love and I chose that topic because it dealt with the larger questions of who God is, uh, metaphysical questions or questions about divine ontology, the nature of God. And so uh, the doctrine of God is, it, it was a main area of study for me already. And the book that you referenced, uh, the TNT Clark book, I was invited uh, by, by TNT Clark to write a book for them. I had a, uh, a conversation with one of the editors uh, that asked me what kind of book would I like to have for one of my classes, uh, what kind of textbook. And I told them I teach Doctrine of God. And so I was invited to teach that class, uh, write, rather invited to write that book. And uh, in writing that book, I wanted to write that book in a broad introductory way that actually laid out the different views of God in the contemporary theological conversation. So in that book for TNT Clark, because I intended it as a broad-based kind of textbook, I don't take a position myself, and I don't argue for a particular position. I kind of lay the positions on the table, hopefully clearly, but also covering the basis so someone could read that as kind of a one-stop shop and be introduced to the kind of contemporary issues in the doctrine of God and theology. This book for Baker, uh, is dealing with the same set of questions, but trying to make a trying to do a constructive approach uh, 
to those questions in the doctrine of God based on the methodology of systematic theology that I just referred to as canonical theology, which just means systematic theology that is normed all the way down by scripture as the final rule and norm of faith. And so in this book, I really got to do a, a lot of the things that uh, when I was researching and writing the other book I wanted to do, I wanted to go further and actually try to build constructive case uh, for why I think the Bible teaches God is, is this way as opposed to that way, for instance. And this book uh, was the result of that work. And so it all depends on what, what a reader is looking for, uh, but I really enjoyed writing this, this constructive treatment of the divine attributes uh, that I tried to base on scripture all the way down. Okay, and then one last question before we dive into your book, the contents of your book. Um, uh, the, the literature on the divine attributes is voluminous and extremely ancient. I mean, there's just, you'd fill whole warehouses with the number, with the amount of literature on the topic. And so my, the question I want to ask you is, are there gaps or deficiencies in the existing literature um, that maybe on the topic of systematic theology and the divine attributes specifically that perhaps you're trying to fill or, or, or remedy, improve upon in your own book, something that it has to offer that maybe other treatments have not yet brought, you know, brought to bear? Yeah, so one of the things my book is doing is making a constructive case for a particular understanding of God that I refer to in the book as covenantal theism. And covenantal theism uh, has a view of, of God's nature and God's attributes that affirms the creator-creature creature distinction, that God is the creator utterly distinct from creation, not dependent upon creation for his existence or essential attributes in any way whatsoever, but at the same time, enters into relationship with creation that actually makes a difference to God's life. Hmm. So in that respect, this understanding of God affirms some of what is sometimes defined as the core classical attribute, attributes of God, and yet it also sees God as relational. So it's distinct from theologies that are sometimes called relational theologies, by which means in something like process theology upon the world, God is essentially related to some world. By world, we mean uh, creation, physical universe. And, and God is bound to the world, not voluntarily connected and not transcendent from the world, at least in any significant sense. That's kind of process theology on the one hand. On the other hand, you have something that is usually just called classical theism, but I refer to as strict classical theism because some people use that label that don't hold the strict version of it. And that that view of God, uh, that God, God as nearly entirely transcendent. So God is strictly timeless, strictly immutable, strictly impassable, and at least on many conceptions of that kind of God can't enter into relationship with creation in a way that actually affects God. Mm -hmm. And so covenantal theism is a view that is different from both of these views that presents a relational God, but doesn't fall into the problems that many relational theologies, at least what I see as problems of many relational theologies that deny the creator-creature distinction. It's also distinct from views like open theism because I'm affirming a robust conception of God's foreknowledge and a strong model of divine providence, for instance. Okay, and and for for listeners' sake that might or viewers that that might be under the misapprehension that process theology and open theism, both terms that you've just used in, in answering that question, are more or less synonymous. H how might you tease out something of a more substantial difference between those two ideas? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Process process theism and open theism are often lumped together because they both deny that God has exhaustive, definite foreknowledge that God actually knows the future in detail. But they're actually uh, distinct systems of thought. Uh, there are a couple of thinkers that, that are very similar to process theology and also call themselves open thinkers. But there's many other open theists that uh, intentionally distinguish their view from process theology. Because process theology says that God is eternally and essentially related to some world. Uh, in some forms of process theology, the world is metaphorically like God's body. Hmm. And so it's actually part of God. It's a, it's a kind of panentheism where the world is in God, even though God is somehow more than the world. Most open theists, the majority of open theists, uh, would say that the world is distinct from God, that God freely created the world and voluntarily did so. And so God is not dependent on the world in the way process theology requires. And many open theists affirm uh, the, the more... Uh, robust view of divine omnipotence, whereas a, a process theologian is going to say, well, God is is as powerful as anyone could be in this kind of a world, but actually he can only act by persuasion. Mm. 
At least that's the way some process theologians think of it. Whereas many open theists will say, no, God is all powerful in the traditional sense. Uh, it's just that he doesn't exercise all of his power because he grants freedom voluntarily. And so it is, there is quite a big difference between many open theists and many process thinkers, although you can find uh, at least one I can think of, I won't mention him, uh, that is very close to process theology, uh, but also refers to himself as an open openness thinker. Uh, so it depends on the open theist, but many open theists are closer uh, to uh, classical theism with respect to this idea that God is entirely omnipotent in the strong sense and distinct from the world, freely created the world and not bound to the world uh, in any essential way. I see. So, uh, so let me see if uh, this just occurred to me and, and tell me if you think this is more or less on track. If you've got like a four point scale where the uh, number four is the strict classical theism that you talked about and one is like the opposite end of that spectrum and that's process theology we might say that open theism is like here a number two closest to process whereas what you in your book are trying to do is construct a, uh, offer a constructive case for a this point right it's, it's it's a moderate form of classical theism that doesn't go as far as open theism or, or even process theology and you're trying to construct a, a biblical case for affirming that moderate uh, uh, classical theism. Would that more or less kind of what we're talking about? Yes, yeah. I think that's an accurate way of construing it, just with the caveat that the way some people define classical theism, if they think the only kind of classical theism has to be strict classical the theism, they would say, well, that's not classical theism at all. And if that's what they mean by it, then that would be true. But there are many others who would say, well, I affirm classical theism broadly, like a William Lane Craig, that falls pretty pretty similarly to the kind of view of divine attributes that I'm arguing for in this book. Yeah, okay. Well, I, what I want to do is dive into uh, a couple of your chapters that I think make for really good case studies on this dis on this difference between a strict cal uh, strict classical theism on the one hand, uh, something like an open theism or progressive uh, pro pro uh, process theology on the other hand, and your case for a moderating m m some a position that leans more toward classical theism. Beginning with um, your discussion of immutability and impassibility in chapter two. So maybe we could begin by um, explaining for us how strict classicalists, uh, is, that, is that what they might be called? Cl strict classical theologians, what they would say immutability and impassibility mean with respect to God's attributes. Yeah, and just before I take that, I just want to make, make it clear to any viewers that even though my position can, can be rightly viewed as kind of a, a moderate position between these, that's not the method. I didn't use that methodology <laughs> to get there. I didn't say, well, here's this view, here's this other view, and I want one to be in between them. I, I land here because I think this is, this is actually the biblical view. I think there are legitimate criticisms of the other views that don't fit with the biblical picture. But it's not as if I'm doing uh, some kind of Hegelian move where I'm saying, well, here's this extreme and that extreme, and let's try to synthesize, synthesize right. them. That's not at all what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to employ a fully, as close as you can uh, to a fully biblical methodology that tries to draw these things from scripture and, and from the canon alone. Now, when it comes to the, the strict classical theist view of divine immutability, uh, the strict classical theist view is that God cannot change in any way whatsoever. Mm. So there can be no change in God's life of any kind. And for the strict classical theist, at least many of them, this is closely tied to their particular conception of divine aseity, uh, which minimally define that God is self-existent. Now, I affirm that as well, that God is self-existent. But many strict classical theists will say God is not just self-existent, he is uh, pure act, by which they mean he is only actuality with no potentiality, right? And so he has no potential to change. They, he cannot have any experiences in his, in his life. He cannot do one, perform one action and then perform another action uh, because he can have no change whatsoever. Hmm. That's the strict conception of immutability. And impassibility. Yeah, impassibility uh, is kind of a corollary of that strict conception. So impassibility is the denial of pathos or passions to God. That's the minimal way of thinking of it. And the strict impassibilist is going to say that God cannot be affected by the world in any way whatsoever. So he can have no changing emotions. He always exists in a perfect state of imperturbable bliss and is not affected either positively or negatively by anything that actually happens in the, this world. And this is also tied to, to other kinds of views of God, including that God is pure act, that says God cannot be influenced by anything outside of himself. And so these fit together as, as a neat package, uh, but 
but they don't seem to fit very well with the way God reveals himself to be in relationship to creatures in the Bible, at least in my view. Well, and that was my very next question, is if we, if we were to treat the Bible as something like a, uh, dare I say, a rule of faith, and I, and I test that strict, classical, theistic uh, understanding of immutability and passibility in light of what Scripture seems to record, what sorts of biblical data would you say seem to, uh, at the very least, challenge that strict conception? of impassibility and immutability. Right. And so so in a broad sense, if you read the Bible and you just read the story, you see God uh, relating to creatures and entering, entering into covenant relationship with creatures. So the God of the Bible is what, what I describe, I just use the term covenantal God. And by that, I don't mean it in the formal sense only, that he's making formal barit covenants with all of the, the different kinds of elements that a covenant requires in that formal sense, but in the broad sense of God entering into bilateral relationship that involves both promises and obligations. That's a back and forth relationship is the best way to think of it. Mm -hmm. And we see the God of Scripture all throughout Scripture, uh, not only creating uh, at a particular time, sustaining the world, creating new things, he speaks with creatures, he hears creatures, he responds to creatures, uh, he providentially acts, he plans things, wills things, calls and chooses. Uh, but he also has many, many instances where he is described as grieving or suffering or lamenting over the world. You have very strong depictions of God's compassionate love and of his mercy where God says things like in Hosea 11, 8, where he, he uses this idiomatic imagery and says, my heart turns over within me. <laughs> All my compassions are kindled. And this is very strong, deep language of emotions. It's idiomatic language, and we can talk about that more later if, if you'd like, uh, but it's a very strong depiction of God being moved in relationship to creatures. The Bible says God is moved to prayer. He's moved to pity. He uh, says in Jeremiah 18, for instance, he uh, says to the nation of Judah, he says, you know, if you will, uh, if you will relent or you will repent, I will relent, right? And it's it's in kind of a block parallel parallelism in Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. If you will turn from your, your wicked ways, then I will relent from the judgment I had planned to bring. Or conversely, if a nation turns from their good ways, then I will relent from from the blessing that I had intended to bring. And so you have this back and forth depiction of God all throughout scripture where God is pleased by goodness, he's displeased by evil. He can be moved to anger, he can delight over his people like he does in Zephaniah 3.17, where I think just about every single word Hebrew language has for joy and delight is used to describe God's joy over his people. And it's looking forward to the eschaton, right? So in that day, uh, he will delight over his people with shouts of joy. Mm. That, that's a paraphrase of that text. Uh, but you just have over and over again in Scripture this depiction of God as undergoing all kinds of change, entering into covenant relationship, relenting at times, uh, experiencing emotional changes, uh, and over and over and over again. And it's, it's not actually a controversial claim <laughs> that the Bible depicts God as undergoing changes, including emotional changes. Uh, the theologians will say, well, God isn't really, some theologians will say rather that God isn't really like that, but almost everyone agrees that the Bible depicts God that way in relationship to creatures. It's just ubiquitous throughout Scripture. Yeah, and I will be asking you about um, the extent to which we can treat that language as accommodative in, in a moment when we talk about the next chapter, but, uh, but, but just to add to that fire hose that you just opened on us, I'll add one more that I'm constantly reminded of, which is the multiple places in, well, multiple three places in Ezekiel where God says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but, but he's willing to execute death-dealing judgment if if Israel fails to repent. You know, I mean, I could see somebody thinking, oh, all that says is that God takes no pleasure in their death. It doesn't mean that God grieves their deaths, but I think that's uh, playing games with the language there. So this, this that strikes me as a God who is compassionate um, and, and does experience the kind of emotional changes that you're describing. But then that leads me to ask the other question, which is what in the biblical data then might prevent us from going all the way over to the, under the other end of the spectrum? If, if we've got these masses and masses of biblical data all affirming that God changes in these ways, what, what in the biblical data would prevent us from going all the way to the process theology answer? Yeah, excellent. So the Bible is also very clear that God doesn't change in some ways. 
Uh, so the reason why, first of all, I should be clear that the reason why God does change in a relationship to the world is because he voluntarily created this world. So God is Trinity, God is eternal love relationship. Uh, the book of Acts says he needs nothing. And so he doesn't create the world because he needs it. He freely creates the world. Revelation 4.11 says by his will, the world exists, right? And so this is a free creation of God. And so there doesn't need to be any world in the first place. And then once God creates a world, he doesn't have to open himself up to being affected by the world in covenant relationship. Those are all free decisions God makes, which are distinct from anything like process theology or any kind of, of similar form of, of panentheism. Scripture is also very clear that there are significant ways in which God does not change. He does not change with respect to his character or with respect to to his essential nature. So he's mm. not becoming more powerful because the Bible also already describes God as all powerful, right? And you can't become more than all powerful, right? The Bible already describes God as knowing all things. And so you can't he can't become more omniscient, so to speak. And so any attribute that's essential to God is an unchanging attribute and his character does not change. And this is actually what I'm convinced is being spoken of in Malachi 3:6, which is the most common text used on all sides in discussions of immutability, where God says uh, to his people, he says, I am the Lord, I do not change, or I change not. Now, sometimes you'll see people just stop reading there, and even some <laughs> strict classical theists say, well, there it is, God doesn't change, and so that just supports strict immutability. But if you keep reading, the rest of the verse says something like, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Israel. So it's already in a relational context, and contextually you can see that what God is saying is, if I wasn't constant in character like I am, you would be destroyed already, right? If I was like a human who overreacts, becomes angry, uh, has irrational emotions, uh, you wouldn't be here. But because I'm God and not human and I don't change, you are still here because I always keep my covenant promises, etc. And then the very next verse, verse 7, God says, return to me and I will ret return to you. Hmm. And so even there, there's already relational change. And so whatever Malachi 3.6 means, it can't mean that God doesn't change at all. Yeah. But it does mean that God doesn't change in some significant respects so that God is entirely constant and entirely reliable. Uh, by looking at a canonical case, uh, I can't draw all the threads together of, of, of the biblical picture, but we find all kinds of hermeneutical controls in Scripture that would deny anything like a process kind of God. And so God doesn't, doesn't have emotions indiscriminately. Uh, he his emotional relationship with the world is not outside of his control hmm. and so in Psalm 78 38 for instance I think it is it says God often restrained his anger in response to the cycle of rebellion of Israel he restrained his anger and he didn't bring the judgment against them that frankly they deserve because he's so merciful and compassionate uh, he never has irrational emotions he doesn't overreact many people think uh, God shouldn't have emotions because they're so familiar with the flaws and foibles of human emotions but God's emotions are perfect. They're always rational. They're always a, a properly evaluative response to the actual state of affairs. And so uh, many people are, are, especially in the Western world today, even struggle with the concept of divine wrath and divine anger, which is a very common concept in scripture. And they think, well, a God of love shouldn't be wrathful or in, in other ways they find that distasteful. But I think they miss a number of things when they think, of, when they think that way. First of all, God's wrath is not like human wrath. It's never an overreaction. It's always just, it's always righteous. It's not God vindictive. It. Yeah, not vindictive at all. Yeah. It, he, he even restrains it. And whenever God finally does execute judgment, he does so only after already giving a warning, making a way of escape, and as a last resort. But on the positive side, God's wrath in the Bible just is the proper response of love against evil. Right. Why do I say that? because evil always hurts someone, even when it's self-inflicted. And every person is a God's child in some respect. And so every instance of evil hurts one of God's children. And so God should be angry at that evil with a righteous kind of indignation, but it's always a righteous indignation. It's not like the kind of, of up and down emotions that humans experience that are all over the place uh, and, and and vindictive and overreactions. God's emotions, all, all, all of God's uh, attributes are perfect, including his emotional reactions. So those are some of the ways in which Scripture guards against a view of God as essentially related to the world, having indiscriminate feelings along with the world. Uh, God is freely related to the world, freely opens himself up to being affected by the world, but he also, at the same time that he's imminent with us, 
voluntarily remains a transcendent God that is also above us and beyond us in ways that that assure the creator creature distinction. So whatever we whatever we say about God and however we understand the biblical language, we should never make the mistake of reducing God to the level that he is meeting humans on. Right. He's always greater than the way he's relating to humans, but the way he relates to us is consistent with what God is like in himself, if that makes sense. Mm. So we don't want to reduce God to the way he reveals himself in the economy, but because God doesn't lie, and because God can reveal himself to us in a way we can understand at our level, what God does reveal himself to be is always going to be consistent with the way God actually is, even though the truth about God is greater, always greater than what he has revealed and always greater than anything we can think about him. Yeah. So then it sounds like what we're saying is the, the biblical data does support the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the claim that there are certain really important ways in which God doesn't change and certain really important ways in which he isn't subject to his emotions. He doesn't have a temper. He doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't get out of control. But at the same time, Scripture seems to militate against saying that he is in every imaginable way unchangeable and in every imaginable way unaffected by emotions. Um, and so there's that an example of that kind of moderate, you know, or, or what you call a moderate uh, classical theism, whether or not it qualifies as one according to our strict the classical brothers and sisters in Christ is a whole other question. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's good. So I want to turn then to another case study uh, in chapter three, the discussion that you have on eternity and timelessness. So again, same question I asked for before, how would a strict classical theist understand uh, the doctrine of God's eternality? Because of course, many of us have just sort of come to understand eternality as merely meaning infinite into the past and into the future, but we still kind of think of it as a succession of events. But that's not really how um, strict classical theists understand God's eternality, is it? No, it's not. Yeah, a strict classical theist is going to say that God is timeless or atemporal, by which they mean God has no time in his life at all, where time is succession. So for God, in their perspective, God has no before and after, that means God cannot perform one action and then perform another action. He can't undergo change. It's very closely related to, to strict immutability and impassibility because change would take time. You have to have a time one where you're in one state of one state and then a time two where there is a different state. And so a timeless God is going to uh, not have any succession in his life whatsoever. So all theologians uh, agree, all Christian theologians that I'm aware of agree that God is eternal in the sense that he has no beginning and he will have no end. But there is a debate about whether God's eternity is this timeless kind of eternity or something that some describe as everlasting eternity, where God is temporal, uh, temporally eternal or eternally temporal. Just out of curiosity, this, this question just occurred to me, but for a theologian who thinks that God's eternality does entail or does include a, his experience of a succession of time, his experience of a passage of time, how would they respond to, for example, the um, grim messenger paradox or something like that that is meant to call into question even the plausibility, even the logical possibility of a past eternal succession of events? How would they respond to that objection? Yes, good. So many people who believe that God is temporal don't don't believe that God has uh, an eternal succession of past events. So there's at least two ways that one might go, who's a theologian who affirms divine temporality, uh, that are prominent in the literature. One is a view that says God was, and this is in quotation marks because there was an actual time in the view, God was timeless, but at the very moment he created the physical universe, he became temporal along with the physical universe voluntarily. That's like a. So we entered into time and created time. That's kind of like this what William the, Lane Craig believes, right? This is William Lane okay. Craig's view, which he calls omnitemporality. Uh, omnitemporality is used by other theologians to mean something different. But Craig calls this omnitemporality. God was timeless. Then at the very moment he created the world, God becomes temporal. And that would be consistent at least with the biblical data of God's relationship with the world uh, that affirms God in relation to creation, because as long as God is temporal by the time you have creation, it's consistent with that language that appears to depict God as temporal. Other theologians take a perspective that's sometimes called, uh, sometimes called the Oxford School that says that God has his own kind of time, which is uh, metaphysical time, which is different than our physical time or his time is uncreated time and our time is created time. And many of them describe God's, God's time as un, like unmetricated time, 
that doesn't function in the same way. Oh. And so you can't, tra- you don't have this eternal traverse into the past. It's his own kind of time that is different than creaturely time, uh, although he can relate to creaturely time or time as we know it. And so there's all kinds of complex debates and, and philosophical moves at work in both of those different models, but those are, are two ways that avoid the, the kind of infinite regress problem that might that one might think of immediately if they think that God is temporal in the same way that creatures are temporal with kind of an eternity, an eternal succession of events going backward that you would never be able to traverse right. to get to this time in history. Right. If you if if you can't divide meta time or metaphysical time into metric units, as you said, then the whole grim messenger paradoxes and stuff like that no longer apply. They no longer lead to the conclusion that it that, 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 it, that it does in created time because created time is divisible in the, into those metric units. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It blows my mind. Um. Well, so let me now ask you the question. Uh, or, or, or start to bring in this discussion around accommodative language, because, of course, strict classical theists are going to say, I think, something to the effect of the language God uses in Scripture, or that is used of God in Scripture, um, that might lead somebody to think that God experiences the passage of time, is accommodative language. How, how else could God reveal himself to finite human creatures without accommodating their, um, their, their finitude? So, how would you respond to that uh, to that argument from strict classical theists? Why do you think that that explanation doesn't really do sufficient justice to the biblical data? Yeah, yeah. In my work, I, I often refer to this objection as what I call the accommodative language rationale, and I agree that the biblical revelation is accommodation accommodative, meaning that God reveals Himself at a level that humans can understand. Right? If God was revealing Himself in divine language, whatever that might be we wouldn't be able to understand it. And so all language is accommodative because humans can understand it. But that doesn't actually uh, get you very far with regard to dealing with the biblical language, because that means all of the language is accommodated. Hmm. And if you use that as a rationale to sweep away the biblical language after you've uh, dealt with it carefully and exegetically, uh, then you're just gonna replace it with some other human language, which is also gonna be accommodative in that sense, right? So you're, you're not gonna get beyond accommodative language. And so that move doesn't tell you whether and to what extent the biblical biblical language actually applies to God. Mm. Now, if you make the move and say it's accommodative, therefore it just doesn't mean what it says at all, then you've divested the biblical text of having any, any revelatory communicatory value at all, right? And so it has to convey something. Even figurative expressions convey some truth if they're if they're conveying truth, and I believe the Bible is God's word and is, is conveying truth. I also believe that God has the ability to condescend and reveal himself at our level, right? So I can explain to my 10-year-old son theological concepts at a level he can understand. Mm. And if I am explaining them in a way that is true, even though it's at his level of understanding, they still remain true, even though there's much more to the story and I'm using much more simplistic kind of language. If I can do that with my son, I believe that God can do even much greater when he reveals himself to us. So that what he says about himself remains true even if it is figurative, even if it is accommodative. So after recognizing language is is accommodative and and much of it is figurative and demonstrably idiomatic, the hard work remains to be done of what does this actually convey about God. Mm -hmm. So you have all this emotional language, and even though it's couched in all of these idioms, it still conveys God having these kinds of emotional reactions. And so one of the questions I often ask, ask strict classical theists in conversations is, okay, once you say it's accommodative, what then does this language mean? Yeah. What does it convey about God now? Because it's, it is emotional language. I agree it's idiomatic. I agree it's figurative, right? Hosea 11, 8, when, when God says my heart is turning over within me, he doesn't mean that there's a physical organ that's a heart that is actually turning over. But this is not just, we don't just have to say that because we know God isn't like that. This is true also of humans in the Hebrew language. Any Hebrew reader would have understood that's an idiom of emotion because the same kind of idiom, and I actually have a, a list in the book of idioms that are used of God to express God's emotions, God's strength, things like, you know, having a, uh, the arm is often used as a metaphor of strength, uh, that God is strong-armed. The exact same idioms are used both of humans and of God, and in neither case do they depend upon their anatomical reference. They're not literally referring to an- anatomy, and any reader of Hebrew at the time would recognize, oh yes, this is describing this emotional reaction through this idiomatic language. So you could theoretically uh, take a human who had, had lost their arms, and if they were a very powerful leader or figure or something, they could still be called strong-armed. 
because it's actually describing their power, right, as an idiom or as a metaphor. And so when it comes to God, you have all this kind of idiomatic language, but it still conveys something ex exegetically. And I think it's very important if we're going to allow Scripture to actually be normative as the rule of faith, that we allow Scripture to speak for itself. And we have to allow these idioms and figurative language to, to still convey what they actually reveal about God. Otherwise, I could use this rationale to sweep away anything in Scripture that I disagree with. Yeah. Because all language is accommodative, so I could just say, well, that part of Scripture that doesn't fit with my motto is just accommodative language. And I don't mean to say that anyone that takes a different view from me is doing something like that or doing it intentionally. I don't mean to cast aspersions on anyone. I'm just saying I don't see how Scripture could actually function as normative if we use the accommodative rationale as a way to divest Scripture of what it is saying. And if we don't use it that way, then we have to say, well, what do these idioms mean? And in the Hebrew language, it's clear what they mean. They describe emotional reactions. Then you do the rest of the biblical work that says, but these are not emotions just like human emotions, because God also says in Hosea 11, 9, I am God and not man. He's already telling you, uh, don't mistakenly think that this, th that I'm just like a human and I react in these ways. And there's all kinds of hermeneutical controls. So the language is not only accommodative, it's also analogical. There's similarity and dissimilarity. And we don't always know the extent of the similarity and dissimilarity. And, and I stop short of trying to say this is where that spectrum ends. I'm just trying to be as faithful as I can to the biblical language with both biblical warrants and systematic coherence. There's a lot more to say about sure. that, but th those are a few, few thoughts. Yeah, that. sure. And, and, you know, one of the th one of the things that I um, face, somebody challenged me with this a uh, number of years ago that has kind of stuck me with, with me since, is uh, take the example of texts that would say that God is just or, or that God is justice. Um, when that... Uh, when, when that when that concept in scripture is used by some people to say object to uh, certain very traditional notions of hell, for example, very often the response and this what I'm about to ask has nothing to do with hell. I'm just using it as an illustration. Um, very often defenders of such views will say, well, God's justice isn't the same as our justice. He may see things differently than we do in terms of justice. Um, but but the challenge to that would be, well, hold on, if any thing is being communicated by the statement that God is just, then there must be some something we recognize in the language of justice that is true of God. And if that's not the case, if it can just mean whatever, then what is being communicated at all? And that seems to be somewhat similar to what you're what you're saying here. Um, well, yeah. well, so then what would be if you could summarize your moderated proposal, if to use imperfect language, of how God is in some perhaps in some ways timeless and in other ways temporal? Well, what would that summary be? How, how is God kind of in some ways temporal and in other ways timeless? Or, or maybe a better way well, to put I, it would be just a more open question. Like what is your moderate proposal that, to, to try to address both, both uh, the biblical data that seems to support a stricter view and the biblical data that seems to support more of the other end of the spectrum? Yeah. So, so I believe that God is analogically temporal, which means that God is temporal in a way that is unique to God. And so God can enter into and, and interact with creatures in time. God can do one thing and then do another. So the strict classical theist has to say things like all God's, all of what are depicted in scripture as God's actions are actually just one timeless act that then have different effects in time. But that's certainly not the way the Bible depicts God as acting and interacting with creatures, as responsive to creatures in time. Uh, so analogical temporality says God is temporal, uh, but his relationship to time is not a creaturely relationship to time. He transcends time as we know it because he is the creator of our physical world, including our physical time. And I don't try to claim to know the way God relates to time as he knows it. All I want to be able to say is that God can do all the things the Bible describes him as doing. So scripture repeatedly affirms that God is eternal, God is without beginning and without end. Uh, and that it also affirms very clearly that there is a huge difference between the way creatures relate to time and God's relationship to time. But scripture also represents God as having a history and performing successive actions, depicts God as active and interactive and as a covenantal God. And so I believe the cross is a past event even from God's perspective. And I believe that the eschaton, the, the, the eternal... Uh, redemption of humans and the final consummation of history so that humans are reconciled to God 
is in the future even from God's perspective. In fact, I think that Zephaniah 3.17, for instance, actually points in this direction. And this doesn't rely on any kind uh, of just uh, something unique to, to Hebrew form. Uh, but in Zephaniah 3.17, it leads in by saying, in that day. And then it describes God's delight over his people in that day, which is for day. And so this is kind of the consistent witness of Scripture that you can use theological arguments to say, well, Scripture doesn't really mean that. It's just using temporal language. But at least at the level of depiction, even those who believe in divine timelessness uh, actually recognize that the Bible presents God or depicts God as if he is temporal in this way. Uh, God is, is very frequently depicted as enduring in terms of temporal succession, existing from everlasting to everlasting. You have language of intertrinitarian love before the world was. John 17, 24, where, where Jesus says to the Father, you loved me before the world began. And so you have all this kind of language that points in this temporal direction. And you don't only, don't only have the language that talks about God in time, because there's a much smaller set of biblical language that is specifically about God in time. It relates to this other set of data we talked about earlier, where, where God is depicted as having changing emotions. Well, for God to undergo any kinds of change, even just relational changes, which is the way I believe God changes on my, my view of qualified immutability, God doesn't change with regard to his character or essential nature, but he changes relationally and undergoes changing emotions. Uh, if God has changing emotions, then God must in some sense be able to experience succession because for God's emotional state to change from one to another, that requires the passing of time in some sense. Now, again, that sense is to God it's analogical because God is not like a creature he's not bound temporally in the ways that we are and I don't claim to understand God's relationship to time uh, in the broad sense I'm just trying to be able to affirm that God is the God of the Bible who has a history performs successive actions and at least as I read the Bible himself is actually looking forward to the day when evil and suffering will be no more and we will have live eternally with him with a kind of intimate uh, union and presence with God that God intended from the beginning, but was ruptured by sin and evil. Very good. And your mention of evil and suffering there will lead us er, very nicely into the last line of questions I have for you, which is around theodicy and the problem of evil. Um, and here, I want to turn away from sort of the strict versus moderate uh, classical theistic um, uh, distinction there to instead, in the case of the theodicy chapter, I think what's interesting here is that you, you introduce a, a take on theodicy that maybe isn't very common in systematic treatments of of theodicy and the problem of evil. So for example, many viewers are going to be familiar with many of the standard theodicies like the free will defense. And in your book, you do embrace the free will defense, but you additionally present what you call a cosmic conflict theodicy. So could you explain that for us and how you think it may uniquely address the problem of evil in ways that other standard theodicies don't? Yeah, I'll try to. I mean, I think the first thing we need to say about the problem of evil is that there are many things we don't know. So we need to approach this with humility. There's always questions even beyond what we think we can say. But I do think the Bible gives us some material to work with that does embrace a free will defense but goes beyond it. I think there's biblical data that indicates that God has unfulfilled desires. He doesn't always get what he wants. And the history doesn't doesn't go the way that God desires. It, it explicitly goes against what God commands and what God uh, reveals as his will given that there's evil in the world and God is entirely good. Uh, so I do believe that God grants and respects creaturely free will, but I don't think that uh, a free will defense that only deals with human free will is going to be sufficient to deal with the kind and amount of evil that is in the world. Now, to be fair to some free will defense advocates, many of them recognize this and also at least hint at the possibility of something like a cosmic conflict. And so even that can fit within the confines of a free will defense. But I want to go further to more robustly push forward on a cosmic conflict, which basically is the view that God is in conflict with an enemy that the Bible identifies as the devil. Now, the enemy is a creature, a mere creature, right? This is no, there's nothing like cosmic dualism. There's not two eternal powers and eternal struggle. The, the, the devil is a mere creature, which means this conflict is not a conflict of sheer power. If it was a conflict of sheer power, there would be no conflict. Yeah. <laughs> because no one could oppose God at the level of sheer power. Right. Which means it must be a conflict of another kind. And I believe scripture actually depicts it as a conflict over character, a conflict over allegations against God's character raised by the enemy. So one of the things that Jesus said that he came to do was to testify to the truth. 
Alongside that, he, he also says he came to defeat the devil. And he actually identifies the devil in, in John 12, 31 and other texts as the ruler of this world. And in the New Testament and also the Old Testament, especially the New Testament, you have the devil as seeming to have some real authority, some real jurisdiction in history. He could only have this real authority and jurisdiction in history if in some sense it was granted to him. And I believe that this authority was given over to him uh, actually by Adam and Eve in the fall, that Satan becomes the temporary usurping ruler of this world. And one of the things that Jesus does in his ministry of atonement as the second Adam is he comes and reclaims the throne on behalf of all humanity and delivers it back to humanity in the end from this usurping enemy ruler who is actually the father of lies and uh, the, the fountain of all evil and suffering in the world. Mm. So in this cosmic conflict, there's a real conflict, but it's not a conflict of sheer power because obviously there couldn't be that kind of conflict. It's a conflict over character. For there to be this kind of conflict, that means the enemy must be working within some parameters that are known to him and are known to God. You call and them, you call them rules of engagement, right? That's right. I call these rules of engagement. And I don't think I can do, do justice uh, to, to the biblical grounding for these here. But you see hints all throughout Scripture, including this motif of what some people call a divine council. I refer to call it a heavenly council because I like to reserve the word divinity for the supreme being, God alone. But you have this heavenly council where God appears to be engaging with other celestial creatures uh, that are actually involved in some sense in the way the world is governed. And you have all kinds of different stories and narratives. Uh, in the temptation, for instance, you have Jesus being tempted by the devil uh, to do all kinds of things like turn stones into bread, which at least in a vacuum, there's nothing intrinsically immoral about turning stones into bread, but there seems to be some rules of engagement going on in the conflict there. In Daniel 10, you have an angel that is sent by God to Daniel, who's been praying and fasting for three weeks. Uh, and the angel finally comes to Daniel and says that his prayer was heard from the first day, but he was withstood or opposed by the Prince of Persia, which suggests that something else is going on behind the scenes that is even affecting agents sent by God. Mm -hmm. And again, this can't be a matter of power. Uh, God could idiomatically, metaphorically snap his fingers, right? And immediately do whatever he wants. He wouldn't have to even send an angel. He could just implant in Daniel's mind what he wants him to know if God wasn't working within some kind of parameters. Now, all that is to say is if there are these kinds of rules of engagement or parameters in the cosmic conflict, that means there appear to be some things that God has committed himself to respecting, not just at the level of human free will, but also at the level of this broader cosmic conflict, this unseen realm, where there's a lot going on beyond what meets the eye. And there can be many things that are happening that God wants to prevent in a vacuum, prefers not to happen. But for God to exercise his power to contravene them might go against these broader rules of engagement. Now, one might ask, why would God agree to those kinds of rules in the first place? Well, it, it, it's, it's difficult to understand. But if there is a heavenly council, and if, if there really are allegations raised against God's character in this council as if God is being put on trial, which appears to be what's in the background in, for instance, the case of Job, where Satan's not just raising allegations against Job, he's also ra raising allegations against God. If there really are allegations against God's character, and if God really does grant creatures freedom of the kind that they can freely love God or not love God, then it's going to be important for God to answer these allegations, not for his own sake, he doesn't need to answer them, but for the sake of all creatures and their relationship with him, mm -hmm. right? So if you had a spouse or someone you wanted to be your spouse, and somehow someone else convinced them that you were a horrible human being, you would want to correct that for the sake of the relationship, right? For the sake of everyone involved. Now, God wants to correct this, this, these allegations against his character, this slander, which is what the devil is. Uh, he's a slanderer, a liar from the beginning. He wants to correct these allegations, but you, he can't correct these and clear his name so everyone trusts him and loves him by sheer power. Yeah. Because uh, imagine if, say, a governor of a state was to try to squash allegations against their character by using their power, right, to put in prison those who were, who were raising allegations against them. That would only make the allegations seem worse. So the only way these kinds of allegations can be defeated if God is granting this kind of freedom, including epistemic freedom, freedom of understanding, is for God to defeat them by a demonstration of his character and a demonstration of his love. And I think this is actually part and parcel of what God is doing in the atonement. Now, I don't think the atonement is, is reduced to that. I believe in a substitutionary model of the atonement and many other facets of the atonement. But I believe part of what's going on there, as identified in 1 John 3, 8, 
and Hebrews is that Christ came to defeat the devil. Now, of course, that can't mean he came to defeat him at the level of power because the devil couldn't, couldn't withstand him at the level of power. He's doing something else. He's defeating him legally. And this seems to be what's happening in Revelation 12, where Satan is thrown down to the earth. It appears at that moment at the cross, he's legally defeated in heaven. And then in the future, there will be a time when his kingdom is entirely destroyed. But all throughout this, God is working to defeat the allegations by a demonstration of his righteousness. And this is described in Romans 3, 25 through 26, to demonstrate his righteousness, Paul says twice, is what he's doing in the atonement. And then in Romans 5, 8, that Christ giving himself for us at the cross is a demonstration of love. And these utterly defeat the allegations against God, which eventually allow everyone in the universe to fully trust God again and fully commit to God in an unreserved way, which is the only way you can have eternal harmony in the universe for the best good of everyone. Uh, I didn't do justice to all those concepts, but hopefully some of that is making sense or at least whets the appetite for people who want to look into that further. And I don't only deal with that in a single chapter in this book. Uh, one of my previous books, The Odyssey of Love, also with Baker, the entire book is about this particular approach to the problem of evil. And so there's much more to it than I could put on the table there. I'm sure I missed some parts uh, because there's a lot of working parts. But I do think there's a lot of biblical warrant for this picture. Many people, when they first hear about a cosmic conflict, especially secular Westerners, they say, oh, well, if you're going to deal with devils and demons, right, then you've already, you've already given up the question. But I think that those of us that are Christians, if somebody's going to ask us, how do you make sense of the problem of evil? We should be allowed to use the resources of the story the Bible tells. Yeah. And the demonic realm is actually central to the story of the Gospels. If you just read the Gospel narratives, the demonic uh, agencies are all throughout that worldview and a part of Jesus' worldview. And so I don't think we should shy away from recognizing this. And I do think it plays a, a more significant role than many systematic theologians have recognized throughout Scripture. Yeah. Well, I'm intrigued by the prospect. I don't know if I'm quite there yet, um, which I think you're probably perfectly fine with and totally understand. Um, but one, one, I, I hope, too, that viewers feel the same way, that they're also intrigued by it. But I can imagine that at least some of them might have a little bit of a concern. And I want to go back now to the question of Adventism. And this will be the last time I bring it up. I'm sorry to make a big deal out of it. But my, the question some people might have is, this this um, cosmic conflict model that you're offering is this basically just the same thing as, or just consistent with sort of the the, the Seventh Day Adventist distinctive known as the Great Controversy? Uh, maybe put maybe I could put it this way: Could one of my viewers that uh, that isn't an Adventist comfortably embrace your cosmic conflict model without necessarily committing him or herself to embracing that Seventh Day Adventist distinctive known as the the Great Controversy? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the great controversy is the phrase that many Adventists use to refer to the cosmic conflict, but there's nothing unique to Adventism about the cosmic conflict. It's actually a very ancient view that there is this conflict between God and the devil, and it's a very biblical view. And there's nothing in the theodicy I'm presenting that would commit someone to Seventh-day Adventism more broadly, or that is based on Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, in Theodicy of Love, and in this book I do it in, more, in, a, in a more brief way, it's entirely based on the biblical data and arising from the biblical data, and of course the reader can decide for themselves if it actually has biblical warrant, uh, but I'm trying to base it entirely on what comes uh, from Scripture. And the co cosmic conflict views and cosmic conflict theodicies uh, come come into Christian history long before there was a Seventh-day Adventist denomination or any Seventh-day Adventist thought leaders, and so it's not not uh, dependent or unique to Adventism in any in any particular way. Very good. And then one more question on the on this issue of your theodicies. Uh, and I think it's fair to say theodicies, the free will and the and the cosmic conflict one. Um, you know, one extension, if you will, of the problem of evil is the problem of hell. Um, and of course, most Christians, probably not including you or I, think that evil creatures will be consigned to hell one day, there to be consciously punished throughout eternity. How how does your proposed theodicy or theodicies address that problem? Yeah, so I believe in the conditional immortality view, also known as annihilationism, that those who finally reject uh, fellowship with God are actually finally put out of their misery, so to speak. So they actually are destroyed. They come to nothing. They no longer exist. So there isn't a problem of eternal 
conscious suffering that goes on and on forever. I believe that evil is finally put to an end, I think in a literal sense. Revelation 21, when it says there will be no more crying or suffering or pain or death, the former things are no more. I think that is literally true finally when God eradicates evil. Not because he wants to eradicate anyone, but because God, the Holy God, will finally eradicate evil and anything that clings to it. And a God of love and justice could do nothing less than that. So at that point, all you have to do is, is make sense of how God bringing judgment against evil could com be consistent with God's goodness. And I think... Uh, for some people in a Western context, maybe that's more difficult, uh, more difficult than I think that it should be, because from a biblical perspective, the question is not typically, uh, why is God bringing judgment? But the prophets typically ask, why didn't God bring judgment sooner? Right. In other words, judgment is a good thing that restores justice to the oppressed and the disadvantaged and the downtrodden, which makes wrongs right. And the question typically in the Bible is, how long, O Lord, are you going to bear with these people? How long are you going to be long-suffering, right? And one of my favorite texts, 2 Peter 3, 9, is that God is long-suffering because he's not willing that any should perish. He's trying to save everyone that he can save. But eventually, God not only is the God of mercy and compassion depicted in, in Exodus 34, 6, but he also is the one who by no means clears the guilty, mm -hmm. right? And so the only end for those who cling to evil is to be eradicated with evil. But that, that final end doesn't have to befall anyone yeah. because God has made provision for everyone in Christ. He has made a way that he can forgive sins without clearing the guilty, right? He can be just and the justifier of those who believe in Christ, as Paul puts it in Romans 3. And that's just the good news of the gospel. So the biblical story, uh, God's justice of dealing with evil, and I think actually the way God eradicates evil is the most loving thing he can do. I think this is entirely consistent with God's character. And there, in my view, there's no problem of, of an eternal suffering in, in hellfire or eternal conscious torment because God finally does put an end to evil and there is no more evil or suffering forever. Amen. Very good. Well, two last questions around theodicy before we start to wrap things to a close. Um, and, and here I want to turn the sights on myself a little bit. Uh, what what good would it be for me to be an interviewer if I don't let my interviewees challenge me a little bit? Um, you, you touch briefly um, in your chapter on theodicy, you touch briefly on what might be characterized as a fairly typical reformed theodicy in which the reason why God not merely permits but actually foreordains the commission of evil on the part of human and angelic creatures is so that he can display the fullness of his attributes in a way that would not have been possible um, had he not foreordained the reality of such evil. So um, I have a follow-up to this, but first, what do you make of that theodicy? Why, why do you think that perhaps it, it, it doesn't do justice to, um, to, to the reality of things? Yeah, good. Yeah. So one version of this is called the divine glory defense. Uh, so first of all, I don't think that there are any uh, glory bringing attributes of God that the, the full manifestation of them depends upon evil in the world. That's my, my personal view. I think that any kind of, of great making property or, or great display of God's character or his essential nature, uh, there's actually a form of that essential attribute of God that could be displayed without any evil. So some people point to things like, you know, courage would need some kind of danger or something. But I think it's actually rooted in a more fundamental attribute of God's goodness that doesn't require kind of a, 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 a revelation in every kind of its form. And so I, I don't agree with a kind of higher order goods defense that like Swinburne or others put. I know he's not, he's not coming from the reform perspective, but he has the same kind of view that there are these goods that might not be brought about without evil. And personally, I think that there are, are more fundamental goods that those, what he calls higher order goods, are piggybacking on that would still be true in the eschaton. If that wasn't the case, then once evil is all eradicated, you wouldn't have those goods anymore if you really need evil for those kinds of goods. And so I think there's some problem with that kind of view. But more fundamentally, I think, I think there is a problem uh, and I want to be as, as fair and charitable as I can. I have a lot of respect for reformed thinkers and other thinkers that I've dealt with throughout this talk. So I don't mean to be uncharitable or flippant, but I have to, to speak, <laughs> speak about this. You have to answer my question. question. <laughs> so, so, it will be, so it might come across as simplistic at first. So I, I don't mean it that way. Uh, but I do think that there's a problem with saying that God needed this to manifest one of his attributes, right? So if you take the divine glory defense, the divine glory defense says that God... Some at least say God wants to save everyone, but it's some other good more than that, which was to manifest his glory. And in some way, 
God uh, actually bringing about a world that has evil and then damning some people brings God glory in that sense that wouldn't be the case otherwise. I think this is, is problematic just on the level of the idea that God needs this evil to reveal something about himself. Not just in the sense that God is then dependent on evil, that's its own kind of set of problems, but also I'm not sure that it makes sense. Because it seems to me that if determinism is true, then there shouldn't be anything like unfulfilled desires in God. And there shouldn't be two incompatible outcomes, one of which God desires. Why do I say that? For the divine glory defense to work, it has to be true that, for instance, God saving everyone and God manifesting his glory are incompatible outcomes. Now, there's only two ways that I can see that those two outcomes or any other two incom incompatible outcomes would be incompatible. They're either incompatible because God willed that they be incompatible, in which case God could will that they not be incompatible if determinism was true, or they're incompatible because that's, that's a fundamental feature of reality. Now, I think that if something is fundamentally true about the nature of reality, then that must be grounded in some sense in God himself either because God wills it to be that way, or it's in, in some way that is necessarily dependent upon God's eternal nature. And so it seems like uh, somebody who takes that line of thought would have to say something like, uh, either God is willing or actually desiring something that is incompatible with something else he wants because he willed those two things to be incompatible, or he desires something that is inconsistent with his own essential nature, which I think is absurd. And so I don't see how God could actually desire one of two incompatible things if determinism is true. Now, if indeterminism is true, there's all kinds of things that God actually desires that don't come about because there's other agents involved that do things that God doesn't actually prefer. But if God really is determining events, it, it seems to me hard to make sense of why there would be something God wants that's a greater good that's inconsistent with another good that God actually desires. Okay, so with the follow-up then is to offer for your feedback um, the sort of my own personal adaptation of that kind of glory display uh, reformed theodicy. What I have, what I have, as you know, I am a determinist, um, and and that's something I'm willing to give up if I'm convinced otherwise. But for the time being, that's where I stand right now. And of course, the question becomes: Why would uh, a perfectly holy God um, predetermine, foreordain the commission of sin if he's um, if, if he doesn't desire the reality of sin? And what I have come to suspect is that God wants his creatures to be able to emulate his certain of his divine attributes so to, to not just have knowledge of God being in this way it, it, being these these ways but actually emulate those things and so take for example the showing of mercy to somebody or hospitality or, or, or forgiveness right if, if, if God desires his creatures to emulate the attrib the attribute of of being forgiving which um would be sort of a expression of the of the attribute of goodness or the attribute of you know one, we could talk about that but anyway if he wants his people to actually forgive and he's a de and he determines what takes place in time then it would seem the only possible way to uh, for his creatures to show forgiveness is if he first foreordains the reality of sin so that there is sin to be forgiven um, and so that would seem to me like a case where God has two logically in incompatible desires one of which he therefore foregoes in order to accomplish the other so you may have already largely touched on what your response to that might be but flesh it out a little bit more why do, where do you think that maybe that explanation falls flat or at least yeah, is insufficient to some degree. <laughs> yeah. So first I should back up because I, I, I kind of neglected to just mention the kind of obvious part of the divine glory defense where when you're in what you just said goes beyond this. Uh, but where somebody says that God is doing this to manifest his glory, if God is actually determining everything, he wouldn't he wouldn't theoretically need a manifestation because he could immediately make every creature aware of his glory in their own internal consciousness. Now you're going a step beyond that and saying, well, God wants creatures to emulate those kinds of characteristics that are themselves contingent upon being a response to evil in some way, right. and therefore you need some evil intrinsically 
for creatures to kind of put forth those kinds of characteristics. Well, I think that the main response that I would have to that would be that I think that all of those so-called higher order goods are, I think, are actually grounded in some more core goods of God's being that would be goods even without any evil. True. And so in the eschaton, you wouldn't have these kinds of goods. So I think it, it might be difficult to make a case that if there even if there are those kinds of higher order goods that God could desire without running into the contradictions I mentioned earlier, that those would be the kinds of goods that would be outweighing, especially given that those kinds of goods wouldn't actually take place in the eschaton anymore. Once evil is done away with, you wouldn't have these kinds of things like forgiveness and compassion. But I suspect that there are, are analogs or close cousins, so to speak, of these kinds of virtues or virtuous responses that would be true in a world that is only and only full of goodness without any evil. And so I don't see why God would need to create a world with evil, especially with the kind of amount of evil and suffering you have in this kind of world, to bring about those kinds of responses. Secondarily, even if one granted that those kinds of, of goods that appear to be contingent upon, upon evils for them to be manifested in human, uh, in human um, virtuous living or virtuous responses, so to speak, it seems like those kinds of responses could be evoked by a world that has a whole lot less suffering and evil in it, right? I mean, for, for humans to emulate, emulate forgiveness, you, it seemed there would only have to be one thing to forgive, and they would forgive it. And if God is determining creatures, if determinism is true, then God could, they could just have one slide and they could forgive it, and that's been emulated, and you move on. Or even theoretically, and again, I want, I want to ground myself more in the biblical data, but just at the philosophical level, theoretically, you could provide these kinds of responses through some kind of a virtual reality or some other kind of thing, if you really wanted creatures to to emulate it, uh, but I would I would have difficulty uh, thinking of a kind of an emulation model as being sufficient for evil and being something that actually makes evil necessary to bring about some greater good. Because I don't I'm not sure there are any goods that are responsive to evil that aren't grounded in more core goods that are greater and would be true in the eschaton without any evil in the world. I do think that it might get you around the, the two problems that I raised about God desiring something that is that is inconsistent with something else that he desires less because it's an intrinsic to that thing. But then you have goods that are intrinsically dependent upon evil that God desires. And I do wonder if that might run afoul if we push that logic far enough with God's own essential nature, where God is actually desiring some good that is itself in some way dependent upon evil. I think that dependence relation for, for many Christian theists will be a problem. Even just saying evil is necessary for good is is problematic in some people's minds. But it's, but it's an interesting thought. And I think better than the, than the typical defense. <laughs> glory defense. <laughs> well, and, and it is, I mean, I'll admit that exactly that last thing you ended on is the thing that gives me the most pause, is it, I worry that it makes God's goodness in some way, or, or some goodness dependent upon the existence of evil, and that's something I'm not uh, comfortable with. So it's still something I'm thinking through, but I appreciate you letting me uh, uh, pick your mind on it. Before we uh, close, what I wanted to, you know, I, we, we've talked about... Um, your your the, the contrast between the strict classical theism on the one end and then the process theology on the other and where you kind of come in as a moderating position because you think that that's what scripture is teaching we talked to, we, we we've applied that to the discussions around impassibility and immutability and then eternality and timelessness and then we discussed theodicy so I, I've, I've kind of given viewers a sampling of your book but i wanted to give you a chance before we wrap up to maybe offer one or two other things that you think that your your book brings to the table that maybe I haven't highlighted so that you can uh, it, encourage viewers with a little bit more reasons to check it out. Yeah, good. So so some other things we haven't talked about that I think are very important. I, I do deal quite a bit with the concept of God's presence and how to, how to understand, I think, from a biblical perspective, God's omnipresence. And then also what, what I refer to as God's special presence. And so there's, there seems to be the biblical teaching that God is present everywhere in some sense, 
but also that God is specially present in some places with creatures at particular times, like in the most holy place of the temple, for instance. and uh, Or in the Garden of Eden, where his in, footsteps were heard. Or in the Garden right. of Eden, or in the eschaton in the New Jerusalem, right? Yeah, walking with him in the cool of the day in Genesis, and then in the eschaton with his people. And so there's this, this concept of special presence, which is an important theme in the Bible, because a lot of what God is doing in the process of atonement is restoring this special presence, which has been ruptured by sin, right? Isaiah 59, 2, your iniquities have separated you from God, and God is overcoming, removing this barrier, so we can be with him in this kind of intimate communion again. So I deal with that quite a bit. There's also an entire uh, entire chapter on the doctrine of the Trinity, where I make a distinction between what I call the core Trinity doctrine and some other disputes, uh, intra-Trinitarian disputes, where Trinitarians dis dispute different aspects of the Trinity doctrine about whether uh, whether the so-called Latin Trinity is true or something like a social Trinity, other kinds of questions about eternal generation. And I deal with those briefly as well, but I focus mostly on the core Trinity doctrine and the claim that some people make that that Trinity doctrine is not biblical. And I push back on that rather strongly and, and try to point out that the core Trinity doctrine is, I believe, taught by the Bible. And by the core Trinity doctrine, I mean that God, that there is two statements. There is one and only one God, and God is three distinct fully divine persons. You can parse those out into four tenets or four theses. And I go in through, in, the, in, the, in that particular chapter of the book, I go through and show what I think is abundant biblical warrant for each of those four theses that if you take them together, amounts to the core Trinity doctrine, which means the Trinity doctrine is indeed taught by the Bible in a rather straightforward way. And then you have other questions about how does this make sense? Uh, how, does, how does God relate within the Trinity? What does that mean for other aspects of systematic theology that I touch on briefly with a model, uh, what I call the Trinity of love and eternal relations of love. Uh, but I do think that there is some contribution made uh, for the biblical case for the Trinity uh, that is helpful uh, with especially with some people that question the Trinity doctrine and say, well, uh, does the Bible really teach that? I believe the Bible does teach it and does teach it robustly. And the entire book kind of has in the background this this question that I kind of touched on earlier: uh, Who is the God we worship, and what kind of what kind of God does it make sense to pray to? And so all of these doctrines collectively, I think, paint a picture of God as one who who is is greater than we could conceive of, and moves me to worship. And so the end of the book just, just actually ends there. That God is perfect, not in the sense that he is whatever I think perfection should be, but that God, the Bible presents God in all of these ways and God as being worthy of worship because he is all of these things, all powerful, compassionate beyond any reasonable expectation and on and on and on. And all of that just moves me to worship. And I do hope that anyone who reads it, even though it's an academic book, I hope that they won't won't become so mired in the theological discussions and forget the worship aspect. Because I think the whole point of trying to understand God better is not just to, to try to be right, but to actually come to know the living God and then give the appropriate response of worship and then also reflecting his love to others around us. So I do hope that, that this book is actually a, a kind of offering to the living God who is worthy of worship and moves others to worship. It certainly moved me to worship uh, as I was as I was researching and writing it, that struck me because um, I was reading your your book and and when I was when I was I think it's at the end of the is it the end of the introduction where you see, yeah so at the very end of the introduction you say before turning to these chapters it's appropriate to pause to worship the God of Scripture and then you rep you, you you reproduce a portion of Psalm 106 and I I thought that was beautiful and I love that's one of the things I really like about your book is that although you are uh, writing in an academic level and although it's very deep and heady at times it's also I think eminently accessible um, and as you say I think it I think it's meant and succeeds at uh, prompting people to uh, to worship this God whose attributes you explore in the book. So uh, highly encourage people to check it out. As we begin to wrap up, um, one of the things I enjoy doing with guests is, you know, viewers will have now watched you and I blather on for almost an hour and a half, and there's going to be a lot that we said that they're just not even going to be remember able to remember after we're done. And so, in light of that, I like to give my I, I often like to give my guests an opportunity to leave my my viewers with something of a parting message that you hope they will remember after the recording's over, even if they've forgotten much of what we've been saying over the past hour and a half. So, what what might your parting message be that you'd like to leave viewers with yeah 
I think the parting message I would like people to take away from the discussion and take away from the book is that that God is actually the covenantal God who enters into relationship with creatures in a way that your life and my life and life of all other humans actually matters to God in a way that means that not only our lives, but the lives of the people around us are more important than we imagine and should actually rec help us to recognize how valuable we are in the sight of God and how valuable others are in the sight of God. And that God is willing to lower himself uh, without becoming any less God to actually enter into relationship with us and even undergo suffering for our sake, not only at the cross, but I believe that God, because he loves us, suffers when we suffer analogically in a different way than we suffer, but suffers when we suffer because he loves us so much. And yet at the same time, he remains the transcendent, all-powerful God that not only suffers when we suffer and holds us up in his love, but also has the power in the end to overcome all suffering and overcome all evil, and he will make all things right in the end. So I do believe that God is the relational covenantal God that the stories depict, but he is no less transcendent because of that, and that is good news because he is in a position to save us from the mess we are in, even though in Christ, he entered the mess with us to be God with us, Emmanuel, and save us from this. He he is going to be with us in, a, in an eternity that isn't mired in any of this mess. Amen. Very beautiful. Um, you know, you've got already an impressive um, uh, portfolio of, of books. And, you know, the, the ones that stand out most in my mind are your Theodicy of Love, your Canonical Theology. Now you've got the Divine Attributes. Do you mind maybe giving viewers who are fans of yours um, a, a hint at what kind of maybe your next project is going to be, what they might be able to expect next from uh, from your pen? Yeah, so the next the project I'm working on immediately is a project that is is a textbook on an overview of Christian beliefs that is for my denomination, uh, for our Christian colleges and universities around the world. And so that's the thing that I'm working on right now. But the next project that I'm writing, be, that I plan to write, <laughs> I should say, beyond that is I'd like to actually write a book on prayer, a, a, a brief book on a theology of prayer and the God to whom we pray that is even more accessible than this book and comes at it from the question of prayer. Why do we pray? How could prayer make a, a difference to God, petitionary prayer? And does that by looking at, at least the way I'm conceiving of it now, different uh, different instances where individuals in scripture or, or, or groups pray to God and how God relates to those prayers and what that tells us about God and the way we should relate to God and pray as well. So that's a bit embryonic in the embryonic stage at this, at this point, but that is the next the next major academic project I'm planning to work on. Well, I very much look forward to that. I think that many of my viewers will as well. Uh, last question I have for you then is just where can viewers find you and your work online? And if you're willing to share it, how might they be able to get a hold of you if they have any questions or you know anything they'd like to talk to you about? Yeah, so I have a website. It's mostly a static website. It just just tells people what I've written about my books as a landing page, johncpeckham.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Uh, my email is is just jpeckham at andrews.edu, which, which you can find on Andrews on the Andrews University website as well. Um, so those are some of the places where, where people can find me online. Uh, as they wish. Excellent. Uh, again, John, it's it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to call you a friend and to have you on the show. I really appreciate the time that you've taken today, and um, and I really hope that viewers will check out your book because I think it's phenomenal. I, you know, I'm going to take issue with it at points, but what reader won't? Uh, so, you know, just again, thank you for coming on my show and being willing, willing to talk about it. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate appreciate it as well. And appreciate you, Chris. All right. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that interview as much as I enjoyed conducting it. I think there's a lot of thought provoking content in there and hopefully I gave you uh, enough of a sample of the book's contents um, to sort of whet your appetite and tease you into getting a copy of your own. Um, there's a whole lot more in that book that is very well covered uh, and I certainly wouldn't want you to think that somehow we've captured it all in our uh, hour and a half long conversation. Um, so thank you to all of you who watched live even while I was gone for most 
most of that time. Um, if, if you're watching now, either live or after it's been um, archived in the channel, and you're wondering what, and you didn't follow the, the live chat along the way, the movie that I went and um, continued with my kids was Mitchell versus the Machines, I think is what it's called. And it's uh, streaming on Netflix right now, and it's a fantastic movie. My kids and I really enjoyed it. I, I cried a little bit at the end. I'm kind of a softy. Um, so yeah, check it out. Re really good movie. Um, but anyway, uh, so as I said in the intro before I transitioned into the interview, um, two weeks from today, Monday, May 31st at 6 p.m. Pacific will be the next episode of The Apologetics, and Plan A will be, as I said, an interview with Dr. Stephen Meyer on his recent book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if that falls through, then I'll talk about New Testament texts thought by some people to indicate that Jesus' disciples um, believed in ghosts. So that should be, either way, I think it should be interesting, but certainly um, the first <laughs> will be more interesting than the second. Um, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, remember to like, uh, click like and subscribe and notifications and all that. Uh, and as I said, also, please do pray about the discussion I'll be having tomorrow uh, recording with um, Justin Brierly on Unbelievable, where my opponent and I will be debating amillennialism, uh, which is my view, versus premillennialism, which is my opponent's view. And I guess with that, I'll um, go ahead and uh, bid you adieu. Until next time. I've been your host, Chris Date, and thanks so much for watching The Apologetics, where we think together through what we believe, why we believe it, and not something else. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up, like icon, the subscribe button, and the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are streamed or uploaded. Either way, come back in two weeks for the next episode of The Apologetics, streaming live on YouTube every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until then...